has China responded by, without even publicly saying it, started the currency war? I don't think it's coincidental that as soon as Trump started throwing his weight around on tariffs, that the yuan devalues versus the dollar. Hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you on Monday, September 10th for the Miles Franklin channel. And we have one of our favorite guests returning this morning is Dave Kranzler of Investment Research Dynamics to dig into the always fascinating things happening in the markets. And how are you this morning, my friend, Dave? Doing well. Thanks for asking. How about yourself? I, I'm excited. As I mentioned to you the other day, I have some questions I've been saving, looking to run by you that I think will be relevant to people following the markets and what's going on. Um, so to begin, one of the stories last week where the U.S. Silver Mint announced that it had run out of Silver Eagles, I believe it was, um, and it was interesting, they sent a note out to some of the clients saying that this was based on increased silver demand. Now, again, I understand there's the difference between retail and institutional, yet still to the degree that silver is at multi-year lows and they're saying there's increased demand. And now again, I know I went to a business school, so maybe my understanding of supply and demand has been distorted, which is why we have you on here and perhaps you can explain how they're getting increased demand running out of silver while the price is dropping. Dave, what do you think? Uh, you're assuming I have a good explanation. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if I'd make that assumption. <laughs> and first of all, let's, let's modify multi-year low because it's still not as low as it got in December of 2015. Okay. So let's, let's call it a two and three quarter year low. How's okay. that sound? Sounds good. <laughs> multi-year sounds like, you know, hasn't been this low since 2008 or something. <laughs> yeah. Although close to the low end as as it is at 14 and change now, but here's here's the thing. Um I think there's a, a couple factors going on with the mint having run out of silver eagles. Um and at least at this point I'm not sure that it necessarily means what it might have meant in the past especially like in 2008 when i mean premiums got as high as 50 percent of spot price because mm -hmm. uh, i remember i actually remember selling silver on craigslist as a matter of fact um for you know silver was eight bucks and i was selling it for 12 bucks you know and that and people couldn't get enough so um I think right now, what, one of the things I'm watching is just watching the um, the bullion dealer premiums, you know, like SD bullion or or uh, JM bullion or whatever, or Miles Franklin, for instance. And um, I actually, it was just coincidental that I saw the the where SD bullion was selling them. So I don't know what you guys are selling them for, but um, I mean the premiums haven't shot up yet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, per, as a percent of price, the premiums are higher than they were, obviously, than, say, three to six months ago. But, it, you know, when that after that announcement came out, I, I didn't I haven't really seen the premiums move, maybe a little bit at some places. So I think it's it's as important to watch the premiums. Right. And um, I will say that um, there's a local based bullion dealer in Denver, it's called Cornerstone Bullion, and they have a national presence. And it's, it's, I, I don't know what their volume is, but they have, you know, versus like the big guys, like you guys, but they have good, they have, it's, it's fairly large. They do a lot of, of activity. Right. And um, they said that this past weekend was the busiest weekend in the history of the company. So um, to answer your question in terms of, you know, why the price goes down and, and supply runs dry. I mean, it, that's just kind of basic supply and demand economics, right? As the yeah. price goes lower, people want to buy more if they want to buy silver, right? And they have money to buy silver. So, you know, you can buy, let's say, versus when silver was $20 and now it's, say, $14. This doesn't include the premium. Just, just make the math easy. You can buy 
25% more silver right now than you could when silver was at $20, right? So I think that's, I think that's part of it. And also the, the mint sales have been trending lower for the last, and again, I don't track mint sales that closely anymore because I don't really find it to be that important in terms of the overall global supply and demand of silver. Um, but uh, I'm assuming that the, the volume over the last, just call 18 months, has been trending down. So my guess is, is that the mint probably cut back on its monthly production on the assumption that the monthly sales were, were trending lower. So maybe, you know, there, there may have been an unanticipated surge in demand over the last few weeks or last month that has caused the, um, what do they call them, the approved participants or whatever, whatever the authorized, you know, the guys who buy the bullion from the mint and then sell them to dealers. Um, you know, they may have stepped up their orders and cleaned out the mint, but you still could have a backlog of inventory at the at the dealer level, which is why we're not seeing premiums move yet. Right. So, um, in terms of that particular announcement, I didn't get real excited by it. I think it, you know, it's something to get excited about if we start to see the premium shoot up at the dealer level. Okay. And speaking of things that could possibly lead to such an event. Uh, again, we've talked before about the ongoing trade war between the U.S. and its largest creditor in China, <laughs> which again seems a little counterintuitive. Um, well, along with that, something that I was noticing and thinking about the other day that I really haven't heard many others mention, we've heard a lot of talk about how the yuan relative to the dollar has traded a bit lower we were just looking at the chart before we started and saw it really started in April and has traded lower. And I've been wondering, again, this is not, this is, we'll call this in speculation yet. Here it is starting the trade wars and essentially has China responded by, without even publicly saying it, started the currency war because you know, we've, we've seen how Trump and all the other bankers, they love having the cheap dollar. So they think they're, boosting the economy by exporting more, by putting the goods on sale, yet has China beaten them to the punch and actually taken the first step there as evidenced by the change in the yuan dollar exchange rate? And that's a great question. And I have yet to read any kind of analysis that to me seems to be a satisfactory explanation for why, why the yuan has, has gone down versus the dollar, the dollars appreciated versus the yuan. I mean, I don't think it's coincidental. I mean, the yuan was at $6.25, or it was 6.25 yuan per dollar back in mid-April, and now it's 6.85 yuan per dollar. I don't think it's coincidental that as soon as Trump started throwing his weight around on tariffs, that the yuan devalues versus the dollar. You know, I've, I've read all kinds of things on, you know, differences between onshore and offshore yuan or, you know, China's pegged gold to, to the yuan now, uh, you know, all kinds of crazy things. I mean, to me, it's, 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 you know, the best thing to do here is just apply Occam's razor, you're right. The simplest explanation is usually the best, which is China has said, okay, you want to put tariffs on us? We're just going to let the yuan fall versus the dollar and it won't, it, it shouldn't affect our exports. Now, if you look at um, the trade deficit numbers that came out last week, as it turns out, the trade deficit with China has increased. So even though Trump- Didn't we just hit the, was like the largest in three years or so? I think, I think it was that. the largest increase in three years or something, but it was, you know, Trump's bloviating all over Twitter and, and all over his <laughs> campaign speeches you know, about, you know, he's winning the trade war. Well, if you look at the numbers, <laughs> it says to me, he's losing the trade war. And yeah. honestly, I mean, you know, again, it's, it's, um, you know, those who don't learn from history are condemned to repeat it. And every time we've had a bad economic depression or recession in this country, a lot of times it's been preceded by trade wars. You know, I mean, the most prominent being the crash in 29. 
and and also you know geopolitical isolationism you know both of which um you know the current administration is is yeah. heavy doses of so <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the trade wars and the tariffs that Trump started, it's going to cause more damage than, than, it's, than, it's, than it's going to, you know, problems that it's going to fix. And ultimately, it's going to cause more unemployment in this country. At the I, end of the day. Uh, I mean, ever since I started reading Austrian economics, it's uh, which decade ago, and then you see what's happening now, it, it's baffling. And I... I tend to wonder if perhaps what they're telling us is completely different from what's going on behind the scenes. I mean, who knows? Yeah, of course. Just on the face of it, it's so bizarre. And again, you know, I don't want to read into things, but then I was sitting there thinking, I'm like, geez, this Yuan really at that same time. So will be interesting to see if we get clarification as that goes forward. Um, but to the degree of what we can do now, you and I talked about this a little bit the other day. And full disclaimer, this is not legal trading advice. This is just getting Dave's opinion on a question that I think is interesting to discuss. Wait, let but, me call my lawyer here and make sure I can answer these questions. <laughs> yeah, well, at least the CFTC is probably not watching, so we're safe there. <laughs> Nothing we know they're not watching these the markets. Um, Again, I'm a former option trader, um, so at times I've put options on to try and capture what I believe will be some big moves in the markets. Again, we'll leave aside the time frame of that for another discussion, but let's say, again, hypothetically, of course, everybody needs to make their own decisions and research, yet let's say I picked that I think sparks are going to fly in gold and silver real estate we're going to see something like a lehman moment and i pick whatever my date is with options you can choose different expirations so let's say i had money in account and i decided maybe i think in the next year it's going to happen so i buy options expiring january of 2020 or whatever the date is but what trades would you be looking at in terms of really, if you're expecting big moves, again, I'll preface this by saying this is an option trade where you should also be prepared if your timing is not right that you could have 100% loss. So this is not the same as buying bullion and wanna be clear about that. But if you're taking a small part of your portfolio and saying whether it's buying maybe options on a, a, a silver mine or, or puts on a real estate uh, company, what were some of the things, if you felt you knew when something or had a good time window and really wanted to nail it, what would you do, Dave? <laughs> Put all my money into a survival bunker because what's coming <laughs> at us is not going to be pleasant. <laughs> but I don't know the timing on that. So <laughs> I still want to have disposable income that I can enjoy. Um, right. No, that, that's a good question. I think in terms of if you're looking for mining stock ideas, that'll have a lot of upside if silver goes from say 14 to 30 or whatever, right? 14 to 25. Um, first of all, I just wanna say that, you know, right now I think the mining stocks in general as an asset class are probably the cheapest they've been since the bull market started in 2000, other than back in 2000, 2001. And there's several different ways you can measure that. Um, but I mean, if you if you ever want to get into a sector where there's blood in the streets and everyone hates it, you know, the mining stocks and the precious metals, now's the time to do it. Right. Um, and that doesn't mean they're not going to go lower from here for a while. I, I, you know, who knows? I mean, uh, you know, the manipulated markets are impossible to predict in the short term or sometimes even in the intermediate term. But at some point, they're going to lose the ability to rig it, and it's going to take off again like it did in 2008. Um, I guess if you wanted to go with a large cap producer, I'd probably, and you, and you think silver is going to go a lot higher, and you want, you want to put your money into a stock or an option that's going to move a lot, I think First Majestic is the way to go. And that's not to say that I don't think First Majestic is necessarily the best value in the silver mining sector, but it's it's a um, it's kind of a cult stock, 
It's a chat board favorite, it's a trader favorite, and when the sector starts to move, First Majestic can really move. Right. Um, I think the last time around, I think it went from, you know, starting in like maybe December of 2015, it was like maybe at two. Again, I'd have to pull up my chart, and I think it peaked I think it went from three to 18 bucks, while yeah, silver oh went God. from so, 17 to 20. Right, and that's that's the kind of move you're looking for. So, I mean, the two ways that I would play that, um, and, uh, the first thing that I would do is probably look at, um, some, some deep in the money call options. So, you know, and you do that because it, it, it replicates buying the stock, but it also, because they're deep in the money, you don't have a lot of embedded time premium. As you know, you must have black shoals and, you know, memorized, um, the options pricing model. But um, so, for instance, the January 2020 um, three strikes are offered at 280 right now, and the stock's at 540. So you have 40 cents of premium for, well, this is telling me 494 days. I mean, that's not a lot of time premium. I mean, if you, if you were to look at, you know, the equivalent call option on Amazon, I mean, the, the premium would be huge relative to the strike price and where the stock trades right now. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, that's the thing about, you know, these stocks, these mining stocks that have options on them. I mean, the, 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 the premium has been kind of, the wind has been kind of sucked out of the sales of the premium on the call options. Yeah. Um, and so now's a great time to buy them. And I'd probably look at, at the January 2023s. And the reason why I say that is, let's just say you pay the offered side. You might be able to get them, you know, closer to 275 or 270 if you're patient. Um, you're basically, you know, for one, one contract, you're getting, what is it, 10 shares per contract? Yeah. 100. 100 shares. So you're getting 100 shares for... Let's say you, buy, you pay 280, $280 versus buying the stock outright. You're getting a hundred shares, you know, a hundred shares for $539. You know, it's essentially, it replicates buying the stock, assuming, you know, the stock doesn't go below the strike price of three. Um, you, you know, you're, you're essentially replicating buying the stock for $2 and 80 cents instead of outright buying the stock. Right. You know, you're paying a little bit of time premium in there. So that, that's one idea. Then the other idea, if you want a you know high risk, high return, low dollar cost um, scenario, and I'm actually surprised these calls are this cheap, you could buy the ten strikes for fifty cents. You might even be able to get them for forty five cents. Yeah. You know, if if you get a little bit of a downdraft in the in the stock, you know, and if if uh, First Majestic shoots back up to nineteen before expiration. You've got a you've got a call option that has an intrinsic value of nine dollars in it that you paid fifty cents for. I mean, you know, in in my world of speculation, that's a grand slam home run where the ball travels a mile outside of the park. Yeah. <laughs> so that that's one idea there. I mean, the other you know another idea would just be, um, you know, junior mining stocks themselves are essentially their options especially the ones that, that trade below a buck. They're call options on whether or not this company, which, you know, and I, I like to look for ones that at least have, you know, discovered mineralization on their property. Not doesn't have to necessarily be approved deposit, but, um, you know, it's a, it's a call option on whether or not this particular company can turn mineralization on a property into eventually turn it into a mine. Right. So, you know, I look at juniors as, as call options and, and they have that kind of embedded leverage in them. Um, and I would just look for a good silver junior mining stock. Um, I cover, there's not a lot of them out there that are pure silvers, but I cover, um, you know, a handful of them in my mining stock journal. As you know, you, you read, you read it. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm yeah. actually taking notes now, so I'm combining a file and remembering things, so I'm getting there. One that, one that I really like is a company called Brixton Metals, and it's, they, they bought a property in, in um, Ontario, I believe it is, or Quebec, whatever, wherever the Cobalt camp is in, in Canada, and they, they bought a, a, what they thought they were buying was a silver property, and it turns out to be a, a, 
so far with the drilling that they've done on it, it's, it's a very um, high grade silver cobalt deposit. Huh. It was kind of a surprise for them. That's and nice I find. think at some point, I think at some point, like first cobalt will probably take, you know, buy the property from them for a nice premium, a huge premium. And then they also have a, um, a silver project in Montana that looks like it could be huge. So that's an example of a junior. And it's really, even though they got the cobalt aspect, it, it's really, they focus on their, their next focus besides the cobalt property is this silver property in Montana. So those are, those are two ideas in terms of um, playing, you know, sparks fly and the precious metals go crazy two ideas there in terms of um, making a bearish bet on stocks. Um, I mean, for me, the no brainer trade is, is Tesla puts, you know, and yep. I would go out to at least the middle of 2019. And I, in fact, I I've traded in and out of the, the June 2019 100s. Um, profitably, and um, a, a friend of mine has the June 2019 200. So, I, I think, I think you know Tesla stock. I, I like going out to 2020, and I own the 2020 100s. Uh -huh. um, I think Tesla stock will be at zero before those puts expire. So, you know, okay. I think they're trading at or let me see. So they're eleven. They're offered eleven sixty five right now. So you're, you're basically paying, you know, per option, uh, one thousand one hundred sixty five dollars for an option that probably will have an intrinsic, an intrinsic um, value of of a uh, hundred dollars before right. they expire. And on a uh, quick note on that, just for our audience, I would like to point out that Dave has been covering Tesla, not just covering Tesla, but for example, when there was that message that he sent out that it might be taken private, you, I believe, even that night were reporting that that wasn't going to happen. Of course, Wall Street Journal got to that a week later. So again, just uh, to point out that you have been right quite a bit about Tesla and I found a lot of what you've written interesting. And again, any Thank questions you. or uh, thoughts people have if they're looking for specific trading advice, Dave does have Short Sellers Journal and the Mining Stock Journal, as well as a lot of other stuff on investment research dynamics where you can find him if you do want some more expertise with these trades. Um, and the last one I have for you here in my, uh, ongoing quest to make my friend Dave Pranzler chuckle during these interviews. Because I have some weird hobbies, I've been reading and digging into the whole <laughs> Steve Mnuchin appearance at Fort Knox. And one quote I just like to read, and then uh, let's see if we can get that pulled back up there on my screen. Um, I would love to hear your comment on this. Just uh, because one of the things he mentioned last year, Mnuchin said, told an audience in Kentucky, I assume the gold is still there, which is kind of strange in the beginning. If you're there, is it either is or isn't. But then it <laughs> goes on to say, and again, this is Steve Mnuchin, former Goldman Sachs uh, executive and also a Hollywood guy. I'll let people take that as they will. But then he goes on to say, it would really be quite a movie if we walked in and there was no gold. Glad gold is safe. Now, <laughs> again, you know, I just try, again, I think my trading or my training as a trader was great because there's a lot of wacky stuff going on out there for sure. Yet, you know, you start believing things that aren't there can be costly as well so again i do think a lot of the things these guys say aren't an accident but i mean in the very least those comments if they were just genuine him talking at the very least inappropriate in my opinion given his position <laughs> the way the markets react to these statements but to also be a former movie guy and suggest wow this would be quite a movie <laughs> 
I, <laughs> what do you think about that one? I, you know, I don't know. I, <laughs> I Steve, I haven't figured out what makes Steve Mnuchin tick other than, you know, pure greed since, since he came into the public spotlight. I mean, I don't know what would motivate him to say something like that. I really don't. It was certainly off the cuff. I mean, what's kind of ridiculous about that whole spectacle, and obviously most of the public doesn't even know this, is that most of the gold, most of the gold that the Fed holds in custody on behalf of the U.S. Treasury has been moved out of Fort Knox, and they've, they've moved it to various depositories on the East Coast. There's, there's what they call a deep storage depository at West Point. Uh -huh. And no one knows what's really down that that rabbit hole. So, um, you know, I haven't been to Fort Knox, but my understanding is there's there's some gold bars on display, and I've I've, I've been told that was for tourist purposes. So, I mean, it was surely it, you know certainly was a some sort of public relations stunt on behalf of the Fed and the government. And what the motive was, I have no idea. I mean, when I when that whole thing went down, I, I almost fell off my chair. I was laughing so hard. Yeah, it's it's. And here's funny. the thing, you know. Let's be clear about one thing. Even if, first of all, why doesn't the Fed let anyone audit the gold? It hasn't been audited independently since Eisenhower was in office. Okay, so it's incredible that that's just it, it's just incredible. You know, this, and even if the gold normal, is really sitting there in the vaults. That doesn't mean that there's not encumbrances on them, right, like right. leases. Um, you know, they, it may be hypothecated. It could be swaps. I mean, the gold can be staying there, but you can transfer title to other parties, even though the gold's still sitting there. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the only way we're ever going to solve this 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 riddle about you know how much gold is really still there and legally entitled by the U.S. Treasury and in custody um, by the Fed is if there's a, and I've always said, I don't want to just have an independent audit. I want to have an independent audit that is open for anyone to see in the public. Meaning, you know, you have cameras and everything filming it and you film it live. And that's what I would like to see. And that'll never happen. I mean, isn't, the, Fed, isn't the, the Fed spent millions lobbying Congress to, to quash Ron Paul's initiatives to edit to audit the fed and he had he had more than one and um what's why doesn't the fed want to get audited i mean that's the big question to me that's one of the biggest questions one of the biggest mysteries of our era is why won't the fed let anyone audit them yeah and certainly uh given the way it's played out i mean all right you so say you don't want to do an audit but what am i supposed to think and i think that's what a lot of people are becoming aware of and why there's growing attention in gold and silver. Um, and I guess perhaps maybe we'll wrap it up by saying the takeaway, Hey, even Steve Mnuchin said gold is safe. So maybe he was giving investment advice. I don't know <laughs> exactly how to read that one, but I certainly agree. <laughs> gold and silver is good. Sounds like you do as well. So with that said, thank you as always, my friend, for joining me today here. Um, again, uh, if you want to just let people know any last closing thoughts and again, the website of how they can find you. Sure. My website's investmentresearchdynamics.com. And I try to put a new post up there, you know, at least every other day. Usually reflects my, my relative state of agitation as to whether I get motivated <laughs> to write or not. Um, and then I have, there's links there for my mining stock journal and my short sellers journal. So that's where you can find me. And for me, maybe my last two comments would be go Rockies and go Broncos. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll probably be calling you later after my, my new quarterback, Sam Darnold, throws his fourth touchdown tonight. So we'll see how it goes. But good that football is getting started. Great to have you on here and dig into the markets again today. And certainly going to be fascinating times going forward. So we will catch up again soon, my friend. Thank you, Chris. The pleasure is all mine. I always love chatting with you. Mm -hmm.